Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. Hmm? Horatio Spafford, who is that? The author of the song we sang this morning, It Is Well With My Soul. Yeah, It Is Well With My Soul. Now, where do you think you got the inspiration for that song? No, the inspiration for the song. The Holy Spirit, certainly, but from the Word of God. You remember the story of the Shunammite woman who's prayed, and uh, they, she, she and her husband built a room for the prophet. They called it the prophet's upper chamber. And so when the prophet Elijah would come through town, she, he would always stay in that room, and he said to his servant Gehazi, find out what the woman needs. Well, she wanted a card from Costco. No, 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 that's not what she needed. <laughs> Gehazi came back and said, she, she's never had a child. She's never had a son. And so he told Gehazi, tell the woman a year from today, she'll be nursing her son. And so it was, remember? Yeah, how faithful God is. Well, after the child was weaned and he's working out in the field with his father one day, he just grabbed his head in an excruciating headache and collapsed in the field. And quickly the father told his servants, bring him to his mother. And she laid him on her knees and was obviously praying for him and he died in her lap. You remember the story? And what did she do? She laid him, immediately laid him up on the prophet's bed in the upper chamber, and she saddled a donkey, and she made her way to Elijah the prophet. And seeing her come from a distance away, Elijah said, Gehazi, find out why the woman's here. The Lord hasn't told me. Isn't it amazing he had such a connection with the Lord that he's surprised that the Lord didn't tell him something? <laughs> I'm always amazed when he tells me, you know. <laughs> And then as she was traveling, the Gehazi met her and said, is it well with you? It is well. Is it well with you? It is well. Is it well with you? It is well. And so when she came to meet the prophet, she said the same thing as her son lie dying on the, dead on the prophet's bed. She declared it is well. Horatio Spafford was the song leader for Moody when he did his crusades in Chicago. And he had, it was a difficult time for a lot of people in Chicago at that time. He sent his family, his wife and his daughters over to England for a respite. And on the way over, the ship uh, encountered some trouble and sank. All of his daughters drowned. She telegraphed him from England, saved alone. Hmm. Couldn't imagine. When, when the captain of the ship, as he was making his way across the Atlantic to England, got to the very coordinates where that ship sank, he penned that song. Now, my personal belief, my conjecture is he got the inspiration of that song from the story in Kings <laughs> of the Shunammite woman. Do we, do we have anything to fear in death? No, no, no. Death is our friend as believers, not our foe. It's the beginning of a new life, isn't it? Yeah. No, not that we want to go prematurely or before our time, but we have no fear in death, no fear in life, no fear whatsoever. Why? Because perfect love casts out all fear. Because why? The Lord is our <coughs> shepherd. And that's what we've been discussing in John chapter 10. So turn with me there. As we've been uh, going through this section of John's Gospel, the 10th chapter, we know that we're in the middle of the Gospel because it's 21 chapters, and here we are in chapter 10, right in the middle of chapter 10. So we're right in the middle of the Gospel as far as the book is concerned or the narrative here. But where are we chronologically in the life of Christ? At the end. As we began last week, we said it was the uh, celebration of Hanukkah or the Feast of Lights or Feast of Dedication. When did that take place? Kislev, that's right. The 25th of, not December, Kislev, right? Although it happens to fall within the December time frame, nonetheless, and Hanukkah is is the word for dedication. It's a Hebrew word for dedication. So at the Feast of Dedication, which is in December, it's two months after everything that was recorded previously from chapter 7, verse 1, to chapter 10, verse 21. So from 7, 1 to 10, 21, that feast that was being celebrated that Jesus encountered the Pharisees on was what? 
Tabernacles, or Sukkot, Tabernacles. And so the Feast of Tabernacles falls in the uh, September, October time frame. Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, Feast of Lights, or some call it the Feast of the Maccabeans, because of the Maccabean revolt that it's memorializing, uh, would fall in December. And this will be, it's probably around uh, what year? 32. This would be the end of 32 because he was crucified, we believe, in 33. He was crucified on Passover of the year 33. So this is four months before he leaves, before he lays down his life, right? And so as we've been going through chapter 10, we see that he has been using these illustrations or parables, this motif of the shepherd and the sheep. And the first parable he gave in the beginning of chapter 10 was the shepherd who calls his sheep out by name out of the world, out of that public sheepfold, remember? The second parable we looked at was as the shepherd takes his sheep out into the wilderness, but he prepares a safe place for them during their wilderness, wandering, as he does for us, doesn't he? And then lastly, last week we looked at the fact that he is the good shepherd who does what? Lays down his life for the sheep. Right. And then as we looked at that, and that was a couple of weeks ago, not last week, but as we looked at that section, we started to go through the shepherd psalms. What were the shepherd psalms? That's right. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. Those are what we call the shepherd psalms. Psalm 22, we went through that time, and what did that deal with? The cross. The shepherd and his cross speaking of the crucifixion that would take place in the life of the Messiah centuries before crucifixion was even a form of capital punishment. Isn't that amazing? So as we went through that, then, then last week, last week we got back into the middle section of chapter 10. We started in verse 22 where he came to celebrate the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter. Let's pick it up uh, there in 22. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Solomon's, this was an, an overhang, a walkway, a colonnade is what they called that. Then the Jews surrounded him, said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. They wouldn't believe. Why? Because of the hardness of their heart, because of the bias that they already had. They've already attempted to kill him three times now. At the end of the chapter, it'll be the fourth time they attempt to commit deicide. (laughs) Foolish. But you do not believe because you are not, verse 26, of my sheep, as I said to you. The shepherd and his sheep, my sheep hear my voice. They know me, and I know them, they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Equality with Christ. Has he said this before? Of course he has. Look at chapter 5 for a minute. John gives us commentary on that. In chapter 5, He healed the man on the Sabbath, do you remember? And for that reason, they sought to kill him. Verse 16 of chapter 5, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus, sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. The Lord of the Sabbath has the right to do whatever he desires on the Sabbath, doesn't he? But Jesus answered, my father has been working until now, and I've been working there. For the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because not only did he break the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself what? And so he is, isn't he? Yeah. But here he's indicating that he is the good shepherd. Not only does he lay down his life for the sheep, but he provides for the sheep. He protects the sheep. He guides the sheep. The sheep are absolutely secure in his hand, aren't they? Aren't they? Not, Not only do we have the promise of eternal life, but that eternal life is absolutely eternally secure, guaranteed. Had some debate with some young men yesterday who uh, came to the men's study and thought they could lose their salvation. And I don't know how you could imagine, I, I don't know how you could sleep at night thinking that. How many of you can go a single 24 hour period without sinning? Anybody here? Well, you're all honest. That's good. <laughs> I read in John's Gospel where Jesus made the proclamation I do always those things that please the Father. 
In 41 years, I've been trying to go through one day where I could say that. All I have to do is get in my car and get on 85. <laughs> and the day's ruined for me. <laughs> but we're honest. We want to be honest to God, right? Yeah. Do you sanctify yourself? Do you cleanse yourself? No, no, no. We, we purpose to set our life apart for God, to be used of his purpose, to bring him glory, to do with us whatever you will, God. But only God sanctifies. What's that name for God in the Old Testament where he sanctifies his people, his children? Jehovah Mikodeshkem. Jehovah Mikodeshkem. The, I am the one that sanctifieth thee. That's what it means, that I'm the one who sanctifies you. Who keeps you? If, if Jesus, now do you believe you're saved by faith, not by works? Sure. Is that true? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. The grace gift of faith God gives you to believe. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? Is that true? Yes. Saved by faith alone. Correct? But saving faith is never alone. Your justification, that saving faith, will always be demonstrated by your sanctification. The good works that God does through you. You don't do them. He, you're allowing him to live his life through you. Through the dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So, if you're saved by faith, justified, that's the first step in that salvation. Well, salvation is in total. You don't get part of the enchilada. You get the whole thing. Right? You know, when I go out to dinner, I don't want just part of the meal. I want the whole meal. Hmm? Well, the same thing is true of salvation. Soteria, that word, the Greek word for salvation, it's an umbrella term. It involves justification, where God looks at you just as if you never sinned, that first step in the process. And, and then the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and life, begins to dwell within you, and you walk in sanctification, right? That's the second part of that enchilada of salvation, but the last part is your glorification, where one day we will be with God forever and ever and ever. Oh, boy, that's heaven. Now, you, you, listen, you can't have justification without having glorification. But as a matter of fact, when Paul talks about this in Romans 8, he says, those whom he had justified, he glorifies. He skips the whole sanctification process. He said, I've done it. I'll keep you. And that's why I say so often, I'm so thankful for God's saving grace, but I'm so equally thankful for his keeping grace. He has kept me these 41 years. I haven't kept myself. It's not that God gets you on the path of salvation and leaves it up to you to keep yourself saved. No one would be saved. No one could do that, could they? No. So look at John chapter 6 for a minute. Talking to the Pharisees once again, in verse 36 of John 6, he says, But I say to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Relative to, com to our conversation, eternal security, and that God keeps you once saved, always and forever. Verse 37, once saved, always and forever. Saved. Only a couple of you believe that, huh? How do the rest of you sleep at night? <laughs> no, you believe it too, don't you? 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The sovereignty of God. God the Father gives the church, gives the body of Christ to Christ, the bride of Christ, as a gift. It's a gift from the Father to the Son. Did you know that? You're a gift. You're a present to the Lord from the Father. But he says, and at the same verse, he says, but all who would come to me I will by no means cast out. For whosoever will, call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We see God's sovereignty. We see man's responsibility. How do you work those two? I don't know. If I think about it too long, smoke begins to come out of my ears. You know. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me. Who has given who? God the Father has given the body of Christ. God his Father has given the church. God the Father has given you to the Lord, to this Jesus Christ, his son. Isn't that wonderful? Of all the Father has given me, I lose about 10%. What does it say? What does nothing mean? Nothing. Nothing. 
but should raise it up in the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me. Everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. You have everlasting eternal life, which is absolutely eternally secure. Is it true or not? So I said to this young man, well, you just made Jesus a liar. Well, what are you talking about? Jesus? John 6, from 37 on in that section, Jesus makes it clear. You cannot lose. You cannot forfeit. You cannot give up the gift of God within you. Romans chapter 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Is that true? Yeah. Now, if there's anybody here this morning, if anyone in my hearing, anyone out in the back who believes you can lose your salvation, and you sincerely believe that, please talk to me. God wants you to be absolutely certain and at rest in the salvation he's given you. Why? You're no longer in a legal relationship with the Lord. You're in a love relationship aren't you? Yeah. I've used this example before, but please allow me to use it again. I had a neighbor, and I was close to my neighbor in New York, and I was very close to their son. His name was Clifford. Clifford was a good boy, but like all boys, you know, they have a mischievous side. If Clifford got into my car and took it for a joyride without my permission... Unfortunately, I would have to f- throw the full weight of the law upon Clifford for doing that to me. Because we don't have a love relationship. He's not my son. He's my neighbor's son. And so we're in a legal relationship. Do you understand? Now, however, if my son got into my car one night and took it without my permission, and I discovered that, would I f- throw the full weight of the law upon my son? No. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No, why? Because we don't have a legal relationship. He's my son. We have a love relationship. And out of that relationship of love, that's the way we would relate one to another. You were of the seed of the woman. Excuse me. You were of the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3. Remember? And then you were born again. You had to be born again. Why? Because you carried that genetic defect, that sin gene was in you, the natural sin, and you couldn't help but sin. Dogs bark because they're dogs. Barking doesn't make them dogs. You sin because you're a sinner. Sinning doesn't make you a sinner. It's who you are. And something has to change with your genetic makeup. I was telling this, and and I'm... sharing all this with you this morning because I don't want any one of you to ever believe for one moment anything could steal you away from what God has done in your life. Now, you can render yourself ineffective and where you have to be disciplined by the Lord, but you cannot lose the gift of God in salvation. Now, now if you're using that as a means of permissiveness, to allow sin into your life, then you may not be saved at all. Because it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance and surrender. You see. I hope that that's clear with all of you. That the gift of God is eternal life. And all, one, all, ne- all that is necessary for one to receive that gift, now and forever, is to accept it. Accept it in your heart. Amen. I hope that settles the matter. I, I, couldn't ima- I couldn't imagine living life. I get lost every day. And I have to get saved again every single day. Don't look at me like that. You're the same way. You know. <laughs> so in John chapter 10, the section we were looking in, Jesus is making it clear they were not his sheep. But he knows his sheep. And, and the word know there is knows intimately, tenderly. He has a communion with them, a deep abiding relationship with them. The shepherd and the sheep. Please go with me to the psalm of the shepherd and his crook. Which psalm is that? 
Psalm 23, yeah. Psalm 23, as I said, Psalm 22 fell in line with that last illustration of the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Psalm 23 falls in line with this last portion of John chapter 10, where he's talking about the fact that the Pharisees are not his sheep. He knows his sheep intimately, personally, deeply. And his sheep know him. He said that previously. They know my voice and they follow me. Now, you'll know if you're his sheep. You know, there's, no, there's no doubt in your mind, in your heart, that you know Jesus and Jesus knows you if you are truly a believer. That is different from having knowledge about Jesus. You understand? We're talking about communion with the Lord. Lord, may my life and my heart be your resting place. And his Holy Spirit will rest upon every heart that is surrendered to him. But in Psalm 23, let's just go over that quickly this morning, because it does fall in line, and I promised I would do that. For the Lord is my shepherd. Who, who wrote this psalm? Huh? David. What was David's profession? Shepherd. shepherd. David never, in his entire life, even as king, he never saw himself as anything more than the shepherd boy of Bethlehem. If David could have been anything else in the whole world, what would he want to be? A priest. David would have wanted to be a priest, to be a mediator between the people of Israel and God, and between God and the people of Israel. But David was a shepherd, and he understood the relationship between the shepherd and his sheep, how the sheep could never, ever survive without the shepherd. Keeping grace. Isn't that wonderful, that keeping grace? Hmm. For the Lord is my shepherd. Do you, do you know that identification, that the Lord is your Jehovah Jireh? What is that? My provider. The shepherd provides everything, safety, guidance, food, protection, everything that the sheep would need, the shepherd gives. Is that, is that your identification with Jesus? Do you, do, you know, do you know this morning that you are completely, totally dependent upon him every moment of every day for the rest of your life? Do you understand that? Boy, that takes away all fear, doesn't it? It sets me free to just follow my shepherd. Amen? I shall not want. What, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. My truth will set you free. My word is truth. So if we know the Lord is our shepherd and we know he has set us free, Free from worry, free from anxiety, free from being mastered by sin, free from the lusts of the flesh. Oh, my. Then we live that abundant, victorious life. I shall not want. And Paul, Paul, the apostle, described what that abundant, victorious life is for us. What was it that he said in Philippians? Godliness with contentment is the abundant, victorious life. When you're living in close communion with the Lord, nothing else matters. There's nothing in this material world that could steal you away, steal your heart away from the communion and the relationship you have with the Lord. Is that true? Big lottery number this week, right? What's the number? Like 650 million, give or take. 650 million. Boy, that's a life-changing event if you won that, isn't it? It would be. Let me ask you a question. I was thinking about this. If I won 600 and some million dollars today, would that cause me to want to stay here longer than I want to right now? No, it shouldn't. I can leave some people that I love uh, in, in, a, in a very comfortable position for a little while. <laughs> but... But as I was thinking about that, I, you know, it, it, would not, it would not cause me to want to be here any longer. My heart is there. And we have to be careful sometimes. You can't be so heavenly minded, you know, earthly good. But you can't be so earthly minded that you know heavenly good. There's a balance here, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I don't want for anything. Do you want for anything? The real needs of life? No. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He provides that rest, that safety, that care. You know, the sheep can only lie down and chew the cud, you know, regurgitate what they've already previously eaten all morning long if they feel safe and secure. 
where they can rest. There's not a lot of distractions. There's not a lot of noise. Not a lot of confusion. That, that's why, listen, that's why it's so important that you do your devos. That you find and you orchestrate a particular time during your day, whether it's early in the morning, whether it's late at night, whatever that time may be, where you can sit down and chew the cut of his word. Distraction free, nobody bothering you, no upsets. You can rest and chew what God has given you. The green pastures of his word that we graze through. Hmm? So important. Not, not just to hear but to really know what God's word has to say. He leads me beside the still waters. Again, the protector that he is. Why is it important that the sheep go beside still waters? I'm sorry? Why should it frighten them? Don't they know how to swim? The sheep gets in the water, they drown. All that wool, all that... They, they won't survive. They have to be beside the still water where there's no risk of them falling in, where they're secure, they're safe. Do you enjoy the still waters of the Holy Spirit when he speaks to your heart and into your life? It's turbulent out there, isn't it? Why, why is it the Jews never had any use for the sea but always for the rivers? Because the sea always spoke of turmoil and distress. I mean, when is the sea ever at rest, really? Yeah. No. If, if you were out in the middle of Sam this morning, right? Sam's out there, that hurricane out in the Atlantic. Boy, it'd be quite a, quite a bit of turmoil, wouldn't it? Did you see the, the pictures from the inside of the hurricane? Yeah, isn't it amazing? They have these devices now where they can drop them in from these planes that measure the hurricanes, drop them right into the center of the hurricane, and they bring back these pictures of those huge waves and things. What a distressful time that would be if you're in the middle of that, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hmm. He restores my soul. Now, what does that mean to you? It is well with my soul, Horatio Stafford wrote. What would he mean by that? No matter what happens in this life, God can give us a peace that surpasses every circumstance, every situation, all understanding. It's a peace that you can't explain, but you can experience. It's a peace that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It is well with my soul. My life is settled. I found my purpose. My purpose is in living for God and living for the pleasure of how many? One. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What does that mean? Jehovah Mikodesh Kem. What does it mean? He sanctifies you. It's not your own righteousness. If you went to Psalm 51, we don't have, I don't know, I'm going to get very far this morning again. Gosh darn it. <laughs> but if you went to Psalm 51, David is declaring it's the Lord who cleanses him. Makes them whiter than snow. Why whiter than snow? Right. Every, every, every snowflake, if you don't realize this or not, every snowflake begins with a dirty little heart. It's a speck of dirt in the atmosphere that ice crystals collect around and becomes a snowflake. So every snowflake has a dirty little heart. Not you anymore, right? Whiter than snow. Yes, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Death is not my foe. Death is my friend. How does the Bible speak of death with regard to the believer? Sleep. Oh, I got a good night's sleep last night. Isn't that, you know, I don't know what it is, but as I was a young man, I never worried about having a good night's sleep. I generally slept pretty well. But as an older man now, sleep... Uh, evades me quite often. And when I get a good night's sleep, I am so appreciative of it, you know. And that sounds quite comforting, that as I pass from this life to the next, it would be like sleep. Wouldn't that be wonderful? When, when my first wife, Roberta, was experiencing the end-of-life issues that she was dealing with, one of the things she was concerned about is that I, I don't like the dark, What's going to happen? Am I going to experience 
darkness, complete darkness. And she referenced this text, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That sounds fearful. Oh, no, my dear. That was Old Testament. That was Old Covenant. Jesus has allowed us to enter into a new covenant, a new relationship with the Lord. And that to be absent from the body is immediately to be in the presence of light. His glorious, purifying, comforting, life-giving, sustaining light. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, so we don't, we don't ever have to be afraid of passing from this life to the next through any darkness. No. The light of life is what awaits us. For I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Who was David's kin relative who crossed over the Jordan with the Israelites? Joshua. 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 Immediately after crossing, oh, I think I gave you a homework assignment last week. What was the name of that place? Bethbara. Bethbara was the place. Now, uh, for all intents and purposes, Bethbara and Gilgal are the same place. But Bethbara is actually the fords or the area of the Jordan that they would cross. Right on the other side, on the western side of the Jordan into the promised land would be Gilgal. Gilgal, Bethabar, essentially the same place. So whenever you read Gilgal, that's Bethbar, the place of crossing, or the house of Beth is house. Bethbar, passage or crossing. It's where Joshua and the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan. So significant. When they crossed over on dry land because God parted the waters, what did he tell Joshua to do? 12 stones in the middle of the river, 12 stones on the bank as a memorial to that memorial crossing. Wow. And then, and then what did God instruct them to do? As all of the kings and the peoples of the Amorites, the peoples of the land, were up in the mountains watching all of this, spying them out, sizing them up, right? Because they were, they were enemies of God's people. What did God tell them to do? Oh, boy. Render all of the men, because you haven't done this yet for 40 years, render all these men completely impotent for the next several days. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That has to be, I think that's what David was thinking about. Here, here are the Amorites and all of the other hill people. They're staring down, and what do they do? They circumcise themselves, and what's the next thing God tells them to do? Celebrate the Passover. The table of the Lord. That's what that table represents, doesn't it? The communion. The sacrifice of the Lord. Wow. What, do we have anything to fear in this life? If you're walking in harmony with God's will as, as best you can, where you're surrendering your life each and every morning to him, and he's using you and empowering you, and you know when that's happening. Because the Spirit's so alive in you. Well, what, what happens when we decide to go down a path of sin? Even as believers, what happens? The Holy Spirit begins to withdraw in our life. It's not well with our soul then, is it? No, 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 no. We, we can't do anything. We sit there and twiddle our thumbs. Thread paper clips together. So we make it right. Isn't it true? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. What does that oil represent? The empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, as soon as we repent and as soon as we return to the... I'm not talking about you lost your salvation. No, no, no. You're a saved man or a woman, but you made a mistake, you know? Maybe you kicked the dog. I yelled at the woman. You know? <laughs> God forbid, right? <laughs> but, then, but, then, but then the Holy Spirit begins to withdraw and you just feel like you don't have any powers to diminish the strength, the relationship, and then suddenly you make it all right. Oh... And the Holy Spirit once again anoints you with his power and the blessing and the ministry of his presence. Isn't that not true? Can you, can you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah. My cup runneth over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me if I'm a good boy. Is that what it says? All the days of my life. He'll be merciful. He'll be compassionate. He'll be forgiving. He'll be long suffering. suffering. 
I got I to gotta have an uh, oral surgery on the 13th. I think that's a week from Wednesday. Oh, I'm not looking forward to that. Whenever I go to the dentist or the periodontist and they start to work, he said, we're going to try to make this as pain-free as possible. I tap him on the leg and I say, you're going to be the first to know if I feel anything. You know, I don't like pain. Mm -mm. All the days of your life, he's going to comfort and be with you. There is no affliction, there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no sorrow. There is nothing we will walk or experience that he will not be with us in that. He is the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And they hear my voice and they follow me. Isn't that wonderful? John chapter 10. Let's see how far we can get. The shepherd and his cross, the shepherd and his crook. And what's the next one? Psalm 24, what is that? The shepherd and his crown. Who is this? King of glory. Malek Kabad. That's what the shepherd declared. And this last portion of John, that's what we see. He's the king, the sovereign. Yes, Jesus said that I and my father are one in verse 30. And what's the response? Verse 31, they knew exactly what he was saying. Some people would say, no, Jesus never claimed to be God. How crazy is that? Hmm? They knew exactly what he claimed. That's why I said three times previously, they sought to stone him, to kill him for blasphemy. They were considering his claims to deity as blasphemous. Who was committing blasphemy? They were. Why? They were denying the evidence and the witness of the Holy Spirit of God, the father of the works that Jesus did, of John the Baptist, of Moses, of Abraham, of Jesus himself that he was the Christ, that he was God. That's blasphemy. That's the only, listen, the only unpardonable sin is when you reject the witness of the, of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ. And that witness will come in many forms. It can become the word of God. It becomes become in a transformed life and you see in other believers. As Gus would say, you truly are a child of God now, right? The witness of the word. Wow. Anyway. Jesus answered and said, many works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? And he said previously, the, the, the works themselves bear witness that he is the Christ, the Messiah. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Hmm. Jesus is God, King, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, Here he's going to show his high, high, high view of what? What? Scripture. Scripture. Jesus, let me tell you something. You'll never, ever, ever be able to hold as high a view of Scripture as Jesus does. This side of heaven, don't misunderstand what I'm going to say, but it's true. This side of heaven, you will never have as high a view of Scripture as Satan has. Satan knows that the Word of God is absolutely true. He doesn't obey it. He's in rebellion to it. But he knows. How did he tempt Jesus? With the Word of God. And how did Jesus defeat him? With the Word of God. So Jesus' response, Jesus answered them and said, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? Now, where is that written? Where? Turn to Psalm 82. That's correct. Psalm 82. Let's, we have to look at the context in which God said this. Or the, the psalmist declared this truth. Go to Psalm 82. That's after 81 and before 83. Page 518. <laughs> Who wrote the psalm? Asaph. Asaph. Who was Asaph? Worship leader. He was one of the, was one of the worshipers in Israel. Asaph. Yeah. Do, do, do you know what the Jews have discovered about pitch, being able to sing? It's hereditary. 
pitch is hereditary. People have perfect pitch, and I don't have it. You know, I make noise, and I make a lot of it, you know. But people with perfect pitch, that's hereditary. You know, how, how many uh, ethnicities that really are known for producing such wonderful singers? Italian. Italians. Very good, very good, very good. <laughs> Italianos. <laughs> Some of the best tenors in the world, Italiano. You want me to sing an oratorio for you? <laughs> Irish. Irish tenors. I mean, you know, and, and, and the Jews have proven this to be true now. Asaph was given that gift to be able to have a perfect pitch. You have that gift, don't you? Yeah. What are you gulping for? We all heard you, and we hear you. <laughs> okay, this is a psalm of Asaph. Asaph is declaring, he's speaking for God on behalf of God. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All of the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of your children are of the most high. But you shall die like men. You shall fall like princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So what's this psalm about? I asked you to discover that, right? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Is this judgment or, or commendation? It's judgment. Who is God judging? The representative authorities of God in Israel. He's judging the leadership, the judges, the magistrates. The word here is Elohim in the Hebrew when he uses the word gods. But the word Elohim can also speak of those rulers or magistrates who are God's representatives on earth. As we go back to the text in John chapter 10, he's going to say, he called you gods, those of you who received the word of God. The scriptures. Who received the scriptures? Who received the word of God? The Jews did through Moses, right? So that's what he's speaking of. This is a judgment against unjust leadership or, or civil government has been established by God. Romans 13, 1. What does it tell us? To obey the governing authorities over you, for no authority is established except by God. Now, what is the purpose for governing authorities? To punish evil, to promote. Right. When, a, when a society, when a nation, when a, a ruling party, when those in authority begin to punish good and reward evil, it's lost its place. Would we say that's not true of the government we're under now? They, they no longer punish evil and reward good. They seem to be rewarding lawlessness and wanting to punish those who are law-abiding. So this, this, listen, this is the context. God is calling them judges or magistrates. It's another interpretation of the word Elohim. Magistrates, judges, rulers, authorities. And he's saying you're judging unjustly. And you're just mere men. You're acting like you're little gods. Boy, don't they think they're God? Don't they think they're God over us? Yeah. Well, they're not. The best of men are simply men at best. They are not gods. Now, I, did anybody go on uh, any of the information that's available on the Internet to see how many, how many teachers, spiritual teachers, they're not spiritual teachers, wicked. How many people claim to be God today? Anybody have any names for me? Let me name some heretics for you. The <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's true, true. But she's civil government. I'm talking about in the church now. What what church leaders would claim to be God? Who? You don't know? Come on. Defilo, uh, Clefalo Dollar. You know who he is? Clefalo Dollar takes this text and he said, "No, no, no. We're gods." Okay, who's the, who's the leader of evolution, Evely, uh, Elevation Church? What's his name? Stephen Frutik. He said, not only did God say, I am, he said, I am. I am God. Benny Hinn, I'm God. Paula White, I'm God. Kenneth Copeland, what do all these folks have in common? Anything? They're all nuts. <laughs> 
Word of faith. Prosperity gospel. They so twist the scriptures to their own destruction, their own hurt. Depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And the gullible people that follow them, you'll have the, the tens of thousands in these auditoriums. It's not a church. It's the, and then the, he stands on the platform, the stage, not an altar. And they're so deceived. Being deceived and deceiving themselves, claiming to be God. It's amazing how many fall prey to this heresy. Now, if you claim to be God, you're committing? It's blasphemy. God is a jealous God. No one touches the cup out of God, the glory of God. No one. But that's how they misinterpret this text. Beloved, it is so important that whether you're here or someplace else, that you're in an environment where you're being taught the word of God expositionally, word for word, verse for verse, chapter for chapter, not taking out of its context. Because context is so important. And in John chapter 10, where you, they use that to spring off and say they're little gods. They don't go back to the, to the psalm to declare. It's a judgment against these people, and you will die like men, and you will be judged even though you think you're a little God. No! That's what God was saying to them. Oh, boy. The psalmist in Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 had the same problem. What was it? They're seeing the righteous, the, the unrighteous, and the wicked prosper. And they almost fell away. They almost slipped. God, how can this be? Now, is it it not disturbing to see the wicked prospering in our world? Seemingly successful. But the psalmist in both cases finally said, until, until I saw their end. And it profited them nothing. Nothing. And that's that's precisely what God is saying in Psalm 82. You will die like men, not like princes, not like the little gods you think you are. For it is destined to men once to die and then all men, all men. Back to John chapter 10. We're doing very good. Is it not written, verse 34, in your law that I said you are gods? And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, right? The word of God came to the Jewish people. And and those in leadership were his representatives and his authority there on earth, but they were doing it unjustly. So if it came to those who received the word of God and the scripture, oh boy, now here's here's Jesus' high view of scripture. And the scripture cannot be broken. Broken. Wow, what does he mean by that? His word is inerrant. His word is is eternal. In Luke, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my my word will remain forever. In 2 Corinthians, Paul was telling the church of Corinth, you can do nothing against the truth. Paul's high view of scripture. Listen, the truth is the truth. And it doesn't matter if the whole world would deny it. Over time, it will be proven true until you see their end. And the judge, every man, woman, and child will be judged according to the word of God. Even those who deny it live as if God doesn't even exist. And there are many who claim that today, more than ever before. But Jesus has such a tremendously high view of Scripture. My Scripture, the Word of God, can never, ever be dissolved, to be broken, to be destroyed, ever. Wow. So so it's so important that you and I spend as much time as possible knowing the Word of God. Because it's eternal. I've shared with you many times before that it doesn't matter what discipline, what study you are, you know, what, what your education is in, what expert uh, is in the expert of some field, all that knowledge, all that experience, it all evaporates into meaninglessness when you exhale here for the last time and you inhale in heaven. And then when you inhale in heaven's air, what's, what's important then? Knowing the word of God because it's eternal. Everything, and now I'm not saying that you should not spend time learning. It's wonderful to learn. Keep your mind fresh. But your knowledge of God and his word is eternal. Any other knowledge of any other discipline or any other study 
It's temporary. It becomes meaningless when you leave this life, doesn't it? For the scripture cannot be broken. Why do you say of him whom the Father sanctified? Who is it that the Father sanctified? What feast is this? Feast of dedication, which is commemorating the sanctification or the setting apart or the consecration of what? One greater than the temple is here, and they don't even recognize it. Now, that's what that feast represented. That feast represented the reconsecration of the temple, the sanctifying of the temple after it was desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes. We talked about that last week. He sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And so they're, they're, oh, they're just uh, wonderful, commemorating what was in type, symbol, and sign of what Jesus is. Jesus is the temple, isn't he? Yeah. And here, one greater than the temple, being sanctified by the Father, by the very works that he's done, affirmed by Scripture, affirmed by John the Baptist, who they recognize as a prophet, affirmed by Moses, affirmed by Abraham, affirmed by the fact that he, he healed a man who was born blind. That would be the sign of the Messiah. Yet they deny it all. But my Father sanctifieth me. Now, please, please, can you sanctify yourself? No, no. Now, I pray for that young man I had conversation with yesterday, but I told him, I said, you know, you have enough knowledge to be dangerous, not enough to be helpful. It was true. Be careful. Study, study, study. Make sure you know what you're talking about when it comes to spiritual things. I went through the process of trying to win approval before God by my good works, and all I did was fail, and fail miserably. And what happens when you try to win approval before God by your good works? What happens? Tell me, what, any of you ever experienced that? Any of you ever tried that folly as a young believer? Yeah, but as you're losing the approval of God, and you know you're not winning, you know, you're like Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a little more passive about it. He came to Jesus by night, but Jesus knew exactly why he came. I don't measure up. I don't fit. But I got to tell you, for me, I just got angry. Why can't I do this? I thought you're supposed to let me do this, you know? I thought, you know, you were, you know, I didn't realize you got to do it all. I thought you, goodness, right? No. How were you sanctified? Staying, staying in the word, staying in the love of God, staying in prayer, staying among his people, and staying in his work. And, and the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit will be continually taking place in your life. Jesus was being sanctified by the Father who sent me into the world. And you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not believe, if, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. Verse 38, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. What was the response? You know, let me think about that. Hmm. You ever talk to a closed-minded person? Yeah, I did that yesterday, too. <laughs> this person said, you know, I got a lot of questions for you. And then a little while into the conversation, I realized he didn't have any questions for me. He wanted to, he wanted to make some statements to me. And I said, do you have any more statements you'd like to proclaim before we finish this conversation? You know, because he, he wasn't listening to anything I had to say. That, that was the case here. They weren't listening to anything Jesus had to say. They already predetermined their rejection of him, their hearts were hardened and they were looking for a reason to justify killing him. Hmm. And how did they respond? Verse 39, therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. How many times have they tried to kill him already? Four. This is the fourth time. Fourth time. You can't kill God, can you? I mean, that's pretty foolish, isn't it? Trying to commit... Deicide, trying to kill God. Why? He's the king of glory. This third of the shepherd psalms, which one is it? Psalm 24. We went to 22, we went to 23. What follows 23 is 24 before 25. So go to Psalm 24. The shepherd and his crown. We first saw the shepherd and his cross, the shepherd and his crook. Now the shepherd and his crown. 
Psalm 24. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. 583, is that what you said? Or 483. The king of glory. Who wrote this psalm? David. David. Anybody uh, have any understanding? Did you go through this ahead of time? What the uh, context is? What might have been the background when David wrote this? He's carrying the ark back into Jerusalem at the temple. And that's what he's celebrating. Now, the ark always represented what? The Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence, right? God's, God, now, now God is everywhere, right? Psalm 139, where can you go from his presence, from his spirit? No place. He's omnipresent, he's everywhere. But, but he purposed to manifest his presence there at the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, when they brought it into the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle the tent of beating in the rebuilt temple. And so this is what David is commemorating, is remembering the return of the ark to Israel. In verse 20, chapter, uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. What is he declaring there? God's the sovereign creator of heaven and earth and all things. What did John say about Jesus as the creator? By him and for him, nothing that was made that could be made except by him, right? Jesus was that creating force of God. Verse 3, the question asked by the psalmist now is that given that God is the sovereign, God is the king of all of the world, all of the universe, okay, who can stand in his presence? Now, when the Ark of the Covenant was returned to the Holy of Holies, to its proper place, who could go before God, the Shekinah glory there in the Holy of Holies? Only the high priest once a year. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But he had to offer a blood sacrifice for whose sins? His own first. But Jesus is that superior high priest of Hebrews who doesn't have to offer sacrifice for his sins. He is sinless. And, and unlike the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood in uh, ancient Israel, when the high priest died, they had to find another. So your relationship with one high priest would be temporary, and then you'd have to begin a new relationship with another high priest. But our relationship with our high priest is eternal. It's, it's forever. But nonetheless, the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, he would offer a blood sacrifice for his own sins, and if that sacrifice was accepted, if his heart was right, it is well with my soul, then he would go into the Holy of Holies and he'd sprinkle the mercy seat of God with that blood. And if he didn't drop dead, because they tied a rope on his ankle, and if they didn't hear the bells ringing any longer, they'd start pulling. Now we don't know that that ever really happened. We have no record of it anyway. But nonetheless, then he would come out and offer another sacrifice, and he'd offer that sacrifice for the nation, the people. But they, only the high priest and only once a year. So David the psalmist is asking, when, Lord, who can enter into your presence? John Michael's always talking about the ministry of presence, right? Yeah, uh, Samaritan's Purse of Rapid Response, you know, when they go in to minister in disaster areas. People who have suffered the loss of so many things. What they emphasize over and over and over again, you're, you're, you're being there as a representative of Jesus Christ for the ministry of presence. And sometimes you just sit and listen. If you, you want to be a good counselor, you want to be a good comforter, then you need to learn to listen and talk less. Because it's just a ministry of presence. Asking God, the Holy Spirit, to bring comfort, love, assurance, just, just through your presence. You ever, you ever experienced that? Well, I sure have. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The right actions, Right? I always say that ortho, ortho, orthodoxy leads to orthopraxis, right? Orthodoxy is what? Right thinking. right thinking. Your right thinking always leads to your orthopraxis, which is 
Right living, right living. So what he's talking about here is the right actions, right? He said here, he who has clean hands commits the right acts and a pure heart, the right motives. Because, listen, that's what God measures more than anything else is the motive of your heart. You, you can do all of the right things and have it turn out disastrous, but God will love you for it. And he'll reward you for it because your heart's motive was right. You can conduct all the right actions, but with the wrong heart and the wrong motive, and it's not going to benefit you. Isn't that true? So what God really measures is your motivation, your heart's desire. Are you really trying to glorify God? Or is it for your own self-interest? Or your own glorification? Now, listen, there's a lot of that goes on today, and it's going on more and more. So here's what I want to caution you of. Ministry is, ministry is a very, very dangerous possession. Profession. profession. Thank you. Ministry can be a very dangerous profession because you can start to think it's about you. It ain't about you at all. Look at all these personality cults that we have today. Look at, look at all these people in Christendom that, that are celebrities. Should anybody have a celebrity status more than Jesus? You know, today is the eighth year anniversary of the passing of my pastor. Who was that? Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith is the founder of this movement that I got saved into, which is Calvary Chapel. And I'm so thankful for Chuck Smith, and I'm so thankful for the movement that the Holy Spirit began through that man's life. And he never wanted to be in control of anything. And if you know who Pastor Chuck was and you had any experience with Pastor Chuck, he, he wasn't charismatic at all. He, he spoke very monotone. You know, he said nothing about his appearance. Just, wow, you know, just, but God used him so powerfully. Eight years ago today, he went to heaven. Mm. And the movement he left behind is changing rapidly. <laughs> And we have so many celebrities in the movement now. And they're yoking themselves with people that, they, that, that my pastor would never, ever have yoked himself with. Ever. And men do that because they want a bigger and bigger and bigger platform from which to speak. That their uh, ministry or their person or their identity is validated, authenticated by the size of their platform. I read in the Bible that in the last days, there would be growth of a mustard seed of an apostate church. That it'll, it'll grow surprisingly large, huge. But in fact, it, it won't be a church at all. In name only. The largest church in the state of Georgia. Anybody know who that is? Andy Stanley. Andy Stanley. And he's made some heretical statements lately. Unbelievable. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more and more surprised at the people that I have great respect for and the people I see them aligning so themselves with for the sake of finding approval before man rather than God. Now, it's very, very, listen, it's very, very important that you get in the word and stay in the word and discover what is true so that you can have a gift of discernment. discernment. You know, the number one need in the church today, discernment. It's amazing how undiscerning most of the church is today. Oh, they're entertained, you know. And they, they, they do absorb some good life living principles, but they don't have any discernment into the word of God. They don't have any discernment in what is true and what is not. What is doctrine from God? And what is the doctrine of demons? And my Bible tells me that as I approach the end more and more, more prevalent will be the doctrine of demons, that we're to test the spirits to see if it's from God. Is that not true? Hmm. So be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. You have a responsibility of your own to know the word of God for yourself and to know what is true and what is not. And you need to be very discerning in what you listen to. Paul commended what group of people for their discernment? The Bereans. Because they would hear what Paul had to say, but then they'd go back and check the, script, check the scriptures to see if these things be so, and they would come back and say, okay, all right, I can accept that. So you need to be a good Berean. 
Today, the problem in the church today, why there's no discernment? They're lazy. I think I mentioned this yesterday at the men's study. We, we have the ability today to interpret well over 90, 90 plus percent of the scriptures easily. Bringing, getting the technical interpretation of the text, no problem. Yet never before have we had such massive ignorance in the church with regards to the word of God that they said they believe. <sighs> he who has clean hands, a pure heart, has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. For this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Selah. Do you seek the Lord? Do you desire the Lord? Do you have intimacy with God? What, tell me what your devo is like. No, don't tell me. Just examine your own heart. Are you really spending time to cultivate the relationship with the Lord? If the only time you're in the word is when you come to church, you're in trouble. I, listen, I'm not trying to hurt you at all. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just warning you. You're in trouble. You can be so easily deceived. Now the, the king is entering in, bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. But one day, God is going to make his entrance in Jerusalem, isn't he? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors, for the king of glory, the Melechabad. He comes in. Open the doors of Jerusalem. Open the gates. Open the city. Open your hearts. And these men's hearts were so closed. They had the king of glory, their Messiah before them. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up your everlasting doors. For the king of glory shall come. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. The Malachabad, the king of glory, is the Lord of hosts. Who's the Lord of hosts? The mighty warrior. The king of the Lord of the armies. The armies of heaven. God is going to displace those who don't belong here any longer because this is his world. It's his kingdom. And he's going to reestablish his kingdom. As I was sharing with someone the other day, you know, we see that the kingdoms of this world, the empires, they're dest being destroyed, aren't they? Aren't they? Look what's happening to the United States alone. This, the, I, I, it's not the same nation that I've grown up in for the last 70 years. Not at all. Nor will it ever be. But it's okay because I know that my God is fulfilling the prayer he taught us to pray for 2,000 years. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Bring that king of glory. The Melech Kabad, come back to Jerusalem, Lord. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Parousia, that's what they say, parousia, right, in the Greek? Parousia is coming, coming, he's coming. Mm. Lastly, John chapter 10, we'll close here. I'm going to finish the chapter, praise the Lord. Verse 39, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hands, and he went away beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. And there he stayed. I'm going to end here because 41 really belongs uh, as the beginning of chapter 11. But in 41, he went to the place where John was baptizing. What's the name of that place? How do you know that? John 128. John 128 identifies the place exactly. It says John was there baptizing at Bethbara. Bethbara was the very, very meaningful to Jesus, this place. Jesus allowed some amazing and wonderful experiences to take place at Bethbara. The first one is at the end of Deuteronomy. Who could not go into the promised land? Moses. But at Bethbara, he gave the children of Israel the law, which cannot be broken which will endure forever there at Gilgal, at Beth Bara. What does Gilgal mean? What does it mean? What? The, no, the Beth Bara is, is house of passage or house of crossing. Gilgal, after they would cross and they put the memorial stones on, in the river, on the bank, then God said, you'll call this place Gilgal. Why? Yes. Oh, isn't it wonderful that Jesus, our rock, our Ebenezer, the rock of help, right? Has rolled away our shame, our sin, our judgment, rolled away our reproach. That's what it means. 
So, so not only did Moses give the children of Israel the law there at Bethabara, the house of passage, no, 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 but, but Joshua brought the children of Israel across there. Now, Gilgal is the same as, 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 as Bethabara. Bethabara is the same as Gilgal. Bethabara is the place where they actually crossed in the river, but on the other side, on the western side of the river, was Gilgal. And then you had Jericho and Bethel. What else happened there? Do you know? Significant? No? No, that was at Peniel. What happened at Bethbara when Elijah wanted to cross the river? He took off his mantle, hit the river, it separated. Wow. Who was with him? Elisha. And Elisha was asked by Elijah, what would you request? And what did he want? Double portion of your mantle, your blessing, Elijah. And so he said, if you see me go up, and you'll get a double portion. You don't see me, you won't get it. He crossed over the Jordan, right? There at Bethbara. That's the place, Gilgal. And he, he smote the water, the water parted. They both crossed over on dry land. And then all of a sudden, he sees Elijah go up. May it be this morning, Lord. <laughs> And then he picked up Elijah's mantle. And could it be? Could it be? And he went back over, right, to cross over again from the east to the west side of the Jordan. And he took Elijah's mantle. And what happened? It got wet. No. It parted. He received that double blessing. The period of the judges, something happened there too. Remember? Who was that guy that was? Gideon. Gideon. When you think of Gideon, think of Don Knotts. You know who he is? Barney Fife? <laughs> that, no, no, that's Gideon. And Gideon, Gideon's down in a wine press threshing wheat. You know, that's a bad, bad. I'm really going over, aren't I? Yeah. Okay. You got another minute? Okay. Okay. So Gideon's down in the wine press. He's threshing wheat. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Why? Because it's down in a hole. And you're, you're throwing the wheat up in the air, and the meat of the wheat is falling to the ground. But what's all happening to the chaff, all that light stuff? It's in your hair. It's in your ears. It's in your nose. You know, it's in, Oh, man. I think those straw bales were brought home yesterday for those decorations. You know, there's straw was everywhere. <laughs> it's okay, though. And, 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 and Gideon was, when the angel first greeted him, what did he say to him? Oh, mighty man of God. Andy, you're not talking to me, Andy, are you? <laughs> now, God saw who he was going to make of him, not who he was at the time, right? And, and so he had Gideon defeat the Midianites, and you know where he defeated them? Gilgal. Wow. wow. Now, who really defeated the Midianites? Who was with Gideon? Jesus. Who, who really gave Elijah, Elisha the power? Jesus. Who really gave the law of Moses to, in Deuteronomy right there? Jesus. Who gave Yeshua the strength, the power to cross over the Jordan and, and then to prepare a table before him where they celebrated the Passover when they were so vulnerable and so weak and so dependent? Are we not? We need to recognize that. Circumcise your heart every day. You're weak. You're completely dependent upon God. We're vulnerable in this world in which we live. We need the Lord. And then lastly, at Beth Bar, the place where John was baptizing. Last verse, last text. Go to, um, go to, go to Matthew 3. And there's more that happened there. Study it on your own. It's wonderful. So that's why this, this place was a very favorite place for Jesus. Jesus went there to be baptized by John. And now as he's being rejected by the nation, this is the last time he'll speak to the nation publicly before his death. He won't address Israel ever again. He goes back to that place where it all began, where his ministry began. That place was very precious to him. And the many, many things he did in the Old Testament period that he, Jesus, had performed. But look with me. Um, John chapter 3, no, I said Matthew, Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and, and his food was locusts and honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all of the region around the Jordan went out to him. Why'd they go out to him? Because he was a nut? Because he was creepy, John? 
That's what they say in Edmund, the chosen, right? Peter likens him in the chosen. Don't, don't watch that. Be discerning. <laughs> you, you, you won't get any solid biblical truth from any of that. Be careful of the entertainment industry in our culture, even when it's so-called Christian entertainment or Christian music industry. Do you, do you know how anti-doctrine Christian music is becoming? Hmm. I don't know, I'm sorry, it's a side note. Verse 6, And they were baptized by him, by John, in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when they saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers. Wait, that's no way to greet a seeker. <laughs> Tell it like it is, John. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, all of those wonderful fruits that the, that the Spirit produces. But look at verse 9 in particular, now to our conversation about Beth Barah. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Hey, I'm an American. I must be saved. You know, I'm a Baptist. I've got to be saved. Do you know there are more Baptists on the church rolls in South Carolina than there are residents in the state? <laughs> Most of them are dead. <laughs> You, listen, it's not, it's not, you're not saved by hereditary, right? No, no. There's only one reason you get saved. Only one way in, one way out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me, in me, through me. Hmm. Do not think to say, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. What was he talking about? Those 12 memorial stones in the river. They would have been in the river when John said that. Beth Barra, a place of passage. Wow, how meaningful. The question becomes, who is this wonderful Ebenezer to you? Our great rock of help who rolls away the shame, the reproach, the suffering, the pain, the guilt, the shepherd, the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. The chief shepherd that Hebrews talks about who sanctifies the sheep. And the great shepherd, right, who brings all the sheep to glory. Amen? Shall we stand?